Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and for real, it is episode 67 of Interstellar Quest. Yes, then episode 66 was mislabeled by some moron behind the microphone. Yeah, so we are currently orbiting Jewel, looking to grab as much science as possible. So if you remember, we passed through the atmosphere to perform an aero braking. Anyway, we need to make a correction at Apoaps to raise our periaps up out of the atmosphere of Jewel because another aero braking pass would probably be bad. So I did that and as a bonus I was able to adjust the orbit to bring it into an encounter with the moon Lathe. And uh, even better than that, after the encounter with Lathe, I will be well positioned to encounter Tylo. So I'm getting uh, two encounters for the price of one. Now the good thing about Lathe is that we actually have a sub-probe that we want to put down on its surface. So uh, yeah, we have the little atmosphere probe attached to the side of it. That's actually been making the uh, burns kind of annoying because I need to correct for its off-center mass. But there it goes, departing into space on its own path. Now it got a little bit of a kick there and if you... Uh, know about anything you're going to know that that little kick has probably messed up my encounter geometry so I'm going to have to make further corrections. I'm going to have to make further corrections. Yeah I haven't even got an encounter right now. So I need to make uh, corrections using my reaction control system to uh, put it within about 20 kilometers of the surface of lathe. This thing needs to aero break and it needs to do it relatively, uh, relatively aggressively. Uh, hopefully it won't be nearly as destructive as re-entry on Joule. Re-entry on Joule, if you remember, we were starting at about 9 kilometers per second. And uh, that's a lot of energy to get rid of. Of course, in a well-designed heat probe, the shield would take all the energy. But uh, some idiot managed to put a strut in its way and we're going to have to build a replacement. So yeah, after uh, some quick adjusting here, we come up with a solution for a maneuver node. You see, 14 kilometers seems pretty close. And so it's now a matter of actually performing that burn using the reaction control system here. Now, of course, RCS is less efficient than uh, regular engines. And, you know, if you really want to have a space probe with the minimal amount of engine mass, then uh, it's better to have, like, an Oscar B fuel tank in one of the Ant engines. But uh, the RCS does obviously add some extra flexibility, which we use during the descent into Jules' atmosphere to ensure that we didn't descend too quickly. But ultimately, well, uh, that didn't work out quite as well as I expected. And I uh, hope that this case is far more successful. We are already planning to build a better atmosphere probe for Joule and to send it there as quickly as we can, but not so quickly that it burns up when it arrives at Joule. That will be a balance that is indeed hard to achieve. Anyway, I set up an alarm just before we arrive in the sphere of influence so that we can make sure we don't time accelerate across the boundary and perhaps mess up my carefully arranged encounter. So here we go, time to time accelerate and watch the majestic ballet of the Julian moons as they orbit the parent body in their Laplacian resonance, which means they all have a periods that are two times each other. In theory, if you have them phased correctly, that makes them more stable, except for the fact that a Tylo is so damn heavy that it messes everything up. Here we go, one minute to encounter. And now we have to be very carefully shift across the boundary here. Now it says we're orbiting at 4.5 kilometers per second, but what we're really interested in is our speed relative to Lathe, which is only 2.75 kilometers per second. Time to do some gravity data. This sensor scans the gravity of Lathe. It helps hint at the diverse terrain under the water. And I think that's the only instrument on this that I can actually run right now, so I will transmit it home and uh, suck up all my power. Oh man, all these gravity scans are really sucking up my power. I have like no electric charge left. And I think, I'm very concerned that I may actually enter uh, Lathe's atmosphere, 23 kilometers. Oh, actually, I think I'm coming in a little high here. Well, uh, never mind about the power. Let's adjust my orbit just a little to make it uh, make the encounter a little more certain to be pulled off correctly. You see I have a, a dual probe SOI change 
that I should have been watching, but instead I'm more concerned with making sure this encounter goes off well. So, we need to kind of push things nope, down, not up. Thank you. Of course, the beauty of RCS is that I don't need to actually face the direction I'm trying to burn. I just hit the translate buttons until it dis until the periapse drops down. And there we go, 20 kilometers. If we were too high up, the danger would be that I would, you know, more or less fly off and perhaps enter an orbit which ultimately didn't end up in Lathe. That would be really embarrassing since this is a probe that really isn't designed to land on anything without an atmosphere. Meanwhile, our other spacecraft is better equipped to perhaps do science at these altitudes. So uh, we have a magnetometer here which will provide uh, all sorts of fascinating data. There is a strong magnetic field here. Joules. And I should have really done the gravity scan on this spacecraft instead. Okay, we are closing in 600 kilometers, moving in at 3 kilometers per second. The beautiful planet of Joule sitting over as a silent spectator to this monumental event in the life of this probe bearing silent witness to the potential destruction or victory that this probe will achieve when it encounters the cool blue atmosphere of this cool blue planet orbiting the Julie Green Giant. The scientists back at Mission Control are of course making last minute checks to make sure everything works. They're making sure they have a stable uplink via the other parent spacecraft. They are hiding away their alarm clock. There is nothing else that concerns them other than the descent into this atmosphere. And uh, this only has 200 units of electric charge, which is a problem because I should really be getting near planet science now, but I can't afford to transmit it because I probably need it for descent. And no, turning the satellite, turning the solar panels doesn't really help give me much more power. So. This just means that the main probe will actually have to come back and make a close pass. Because this one actually has to land, it has only one chance to go through the upper atmosphere and only one chance to do the landing, so uh, it's committed, it is ready, it is braced for impact, everything is stowed, the heat shield is oriented towards the direction of motion. The velocity has risen to over 3.6 kilometers per second, and it is still rising, but that can only continue for a few moments longer. Soon it will encounter the forces in the atmosphere. As the heat shield moves through the atmosphere, the gas in front of it will be compressed along its face, and as anyone that knows physics will tell you, compressing a gas increases its temperature. Furthermore, the gas behind the heat shield will be rarefied, creating a pressure differential that results in a deceleration of the spacecraft. All of this will, of course, be accompanied by an epic fireball as it flies through the atmosphere with one of the finest views in the entire Kerbal solar system. Watching Joule, the Sun, and many other planets setting behind the cool blue horizon of Leith. And our velocity is starting to drop now. Deceleration is picking up very quickly. We're at 33 kilometers. Now decelerating at 1G at 31 kilometers. Flames are engulfing this spacecraft, but the heat shield is deflecting much of this away. I'm preparing for the worst here if that strut gives out. I'm ready to switch vehicle at a moment's notice using the switch vehicle buttons. But uh, it looks like we're up to 8Gs. And 9Gs, where this is looking good. Oh, oh my god, we lost the antenna. No, come back. Come, oh, I think, yeah, it exploded. And we're down to two kilometers per second. This is much more main mundane encounter velocity and the G-forces are dropping off. I think, I think we may have successfully performed a lath atmosphere insertion here. And we should start collecting science now. Okay, that's no good. Log pressure data, rarefied, but you're getting, etc, etc. Atmosphere analysis has breathable elements, but they're very cold and thin, uh, like an icicle. Uh, no, we don't need that data. The temperature fluctuates more than expected, and we should fire the parachute now to slow ourselves down. Now, uh, we don't have, we don't have, oh wait, we do have an antenna sitting right there, so we have a backup, but it needs to get relayed. The air has breathable elements, but they're very cool and thin. Yes, we know that. Now start transmitting it. Unfortunately, I'm gonna... It's gonna use up all my spare electric charge, so... So we can get one set of readings in the upper atmosphere. 
And now at below 400 metres, I think we're probably close enough to be considered in the lower atmosphere. Unfortunately, everything is still transmitting. I think I think I have transmissions buffered for my other instruments, but I'm not really sure 100% how that works. Regardless, I gotta get this data before we touch the touch the water, and I don't think I'm gonna have much time in the end to uh, transmit it all multiple times. Okay, sorry. Log pressure data. The pressure seems higher over the water. Yeah, keep that data and transmit it. And oh, I'm just gonna keep it. I'm not gonna transmit it because we already get transmission pending. It's warmer near the surface. Lathe's oceans may indeed be water. Atmosphere analysis says. Uh, yeah, we want to run that again. There's oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and lots of water. You scribble down a note. Invest in lath colonization. That we will. And the negative gravioli detector doesn't work, and the seismic detector doesn't work. In fact, the seismic detector is going to be absolutely useless because we have landed in the water. Meanwhile, the main probe continues on its way on a very highly elliptical orbit, which should bring it into a close encounter with Tylo at some point in the future. So let's do some science. The temperatures are very similar to those of Kerbin's polar regions. The water hasn't frozen though, most probably due to the high salinity. I'd never thought about that before, but I'll say they're probably right. Let's log pressure data. You contemplate dunking the scanner to see if it can measure depth, but Mission Control says that that will void the warranty. Oh wait, if the oceans are salty, that means that we must have precipitation, right? Okay. Uh, sensor. Oh wait, no, we can't collect uh, air quality data from the from landing. Okay, what else do we have? We have something on the underside of this. Come on, turn over, turn. Uh, there we go. And we have a gravity detector, which I think does actually work on the surface. Gravity detectors work. They don't work in the air, but they do work on the surface. The sensor provides detailed gravity information related to the tides, which are no doubt extreme given the other moons in the system. And yeah, we can't log seismic data, we can't record seismic data, we can't collect impact data, because we are in the water and the water does not strongly couple to the seismic nature of the parent body. Now back at Kerbin, the scientists have been working on a new improved atmosphere probe to deal with the extreme conditions that are experienced on Joule. Now the first thing we're going to do is a simple test launch using this uh, launch vehicle. Idea being that we're going to fly it up to a couple of hundred kilometers and then accelerate down as fast as we can onto a hyperbolic encounter trajectory. So there we go, we're going to lift our Apo apps up to about 200 kilometers because that seems like a good place. We've got to be high enough that we can burn up all our fuel but not so high that we waste a bunch of fuel uh, you know, getting to the extra altitude. So there we go, 160, 108, 9, 200! And there we go. So this has an inflatable heat shield on the front. Now the inflatable heat shield probably isn't as strong as a dedicated heat shield, but the big advantage is that the extra cross section means that it is decelerating much, much faster. So although it uh, does experience the same re-entry temperatures, it has to experience them for less time. So Pointing the nose down 45 degrees, we wait to get pretty near to Apple Apps, and then we just start firing this rocket. 5 G's of thrust we have here, pushing it more or less towards the horizon. We want to kind of get a an impact or an encounter that uh, goes through the atmosphere at an angle so that we can really appreciate the... so we can collect more data. Then we have another solid rocket booster, which we have purposely chosen uh, instead of a liquid fuel booster because we want to make it burn through its fuel as quickly as possible. Note that pretty much all the way down we're accelerating this at about 5 G, so we're already far beyond escape velocity. 4 kilometers per second, we might maybe get up to 5 kilometers per second if we're lucky. And our acceleration is now up to 7 G's, or 4.5. This is still below what we expect to encounter on Joule, but we're going to be entering more steeply. And we're just slightly short when we ditch that rocket. Uh, unfortunately, I can see that we're going to come through the atmosphere, and I should have probably jettisoned that at an angle. Don't hit! Don't hit! Don't hit! Don't hit! Oh, crap. Oh, hey! It survived! Well, that's fortunate. 
And uh, now we're really feeling the atmosphere. Oh, look at that. Oh, it's beyond like 15 G's deceleration. This is insane. Two point, we're, we're now down to two kilometers per second and everything is still slowing down at a ridiculous rate. One kilometer per second and now the G-force meter comes back from being pinned. Brilliant. That is a successful test. Very similar to the test that uh, NASA are going to be performing out near Hawaii from their, for their uh, inflatable heat shield. should pay attention to the, to the news. They're going to be taking it up on a balloon and then up on a rocket to test its deployment process. But anyway, that was a success. Back to Jewel. Okay, so we have our encounter with Tylo, and it is far from ideal, because although we miss Tylo, we do collect data, we end up slapping ourselves into Jewel due to the gravitational interactions. So uh, I try to come up with a new solution that will adjust the orbit, uh, and uh, put ourselves into a more interesting or more useful, slightly more, uh, slightly less eccentric orbit, actually, is what I'm going for. And that looks like we have a periapse of about 2,000 kilometers at Tylo, which is good enough for me. So we set ourselves up. We're moving. Uh, we only need to make a 12.2 meters per second burn. Not that it's a burn. It's an ion engine powered by a miniature nuclear reactor. The nuclear reactor is uh, degrading over time, but it is still working exceptionally well. And uh, even if it degraded completely, we still do have uh, those little solar panels there. Okay, so look at this. Adjusting our orbit so that we... Oh, there's a lathe encounter. Very nice, but we're not going to do that either. And... Come on, get ourselves out of Jules atmosphere. Oh, look there. We could, ooh, that would be an interesting one. We could get a Tylo encounter followed by a lathe and then a Val encounter, but I don't think I'm going for that because it seems really, really flaky. And at this point, I realized that if I was going to continue that, I would actually end up colliding with Tylo. So, uh, plans are made, changes are sought. We uh, instead decide to turn the spacecraft back around and more or less undo that change that I just did. But look at this beautiful shot of uh, all the myriad possibilities of the orbits being adjusted just by rotating the spacecraft. That is the epitome of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. The butterfly effect, as people like to say. Uh, and a lot of that does actually come down to simply the uh, mechanics in the game aren't perfect. So what I did was I'm turning this back around and you see how there is actually an encounter with Lathe there. So I think that I can make this close approach to Tylo and then fly past Lathe, making an adjustment there, and have it kick myself back into a reasonable orbit that does not encounter Jewel. And that is the plan that I went with. Okay, so we're going to fly past, and uh, what I could do initially is just try a naive maneuver to raise the periapse of this uh, orbit back outside Jewel's atmosphere. And you see, yes, I can get an encounter with Lathe, but ultimately, I'm talking about 550 meters per second of delta V, which although I have, uh, it would be nice if I came up with a better idea. So what instead, I'm going to try adding a maneuver node here and performing a retrograde burn to slow the orbit down. And you see, whoa, 33 meters per second gets me an encounter with uh, Lathe. But that's an encounter on the wrong side, which will still hit me into Joule. Now, if I keep adjusting this... And you see, I've added that second maneuver node so I can actually see the future uh, predictions. I could, have, I should probably just fix my setting. And there you go, bang, look at that. So 129 meters per second, that would actually get me a big plane change. Now, of course, need to adjust this a little until I get everything happening in the plane. And hopefully, miss it. oh, that's not good. <laughs> also, that is, in, that is actually hitting, hitting lathe, which I don't want to do. So there... Uh, it's going to get kicked around Lathe, but it's in a highly eccentric orbit, so that's no good. But there, there, I believe we have a solution. And 170 meters per second is less than 550 meters per second. So that is not only a saving, but it gets as an extra encounter with Lathe. So I'm going to take that, and uh, we'll see what happens in the next episode. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>